right. So welcome everyone to our uh, session for today. I am so excited to have you all here. Um, not only to, to be a part of our NAUTIC training session, but this is going to be an absolutely um, amazing session with some great information that you can learn and also take back and use with you in your day-to-day -day work. So I am um, happy to introduce our presenter for today. Um, our presenter is Nathaniel Coley, and Nathaniel is the Division Chief for the Department of Indian and Native American Programs. Um, Nathaniel is going to give a, he's going to provide us with some great learning opportunity today over uh, our next 45 minutes together, approximately 45 minutes together. Um, I'm going to let Nathaniel introduce himself. So I know he had a biography, but I, you know, I could read the biography, but it's nothing like coming from the person himself. So, so glad to have you here, Nathaniel. Glad to have you all here. Go ahead and continue to introduce yourselves in the chat box and I will turn it over um, to Nathaniel. And I will say that this is going to be recorded and we it will be available on our YouTube channel, our NAUTIP YouTube channel. And I'll also be sending you all that link. So you can also share uh, this link with any of your network. So Nathaniel, this time I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Kim. I appreciate it. And uh, welcome, everyone. I appreciate the opportunity to um, just share some insights um, from um, with the Department of Labor and uh, my team, we're called the Division of Indian and Native American Programs, and we have an acronym, DINAP. So if you ever see that, you know that um, you're dealing with the Division of Indian and Native American Programs at the Department of Labor. <clears throat> and um, I'll talk a little bit about our, our program and what we do here on our team. Um, let me share my screen here. So, um, but today, um, I just want to talk about just some ways that we can collaborate um, and I've heard from many in the workforce that they've never had an opportunity to work with, um, with, with Native American programs or they haven't served Native Americans in their programs or in their sessions. I see, you know, Colorado and Oregon, there, there are a lot of folks that have Natives in their regions. Um, we were, my team, we were out at, uh, on the Navajo Reservation, which many of you may know covers multiple states. It's large. And we found that there was a, a workforce board that were actually serving, um, you know, just as many Navajo off the reservation than, than were being served on the reservation. So us being able to facilitate, facilitate that collaboration was a strategic opportunity for the, for the Navajo Workforce Department, as well as that workforce board that were serving Navajo off the reservation. And, and I'll talk a little bit about just some of the strategies and opportunities and how, how we can work with some of our, our native participants as well. So, um, so just to get going here. So I'll just, just give an overview, just some background, and, and then I'll just talk about just some of the ways that we can partner, some of the challenges and some of the strategies. And, um, and I'll just talk about a couple examples that uh, another member of our team actually shared in a presentation recently about some of our grantees, to, uh, we we serve we we uh, provide grants to workforce development organizations, and then just um, some opportunity for us to <clears throat> for us to discuss. So the, the first thing, you know, really, you know, when we're dealing with tribal communities, you know, we're often we're dealing with nations within a nation, you know, and this includes the treatment of these nations in this country, you know, just presenting unique challenges. And many of those challenges are based on the history and the context of how, you know, how we, this country has interacted with Native Americans throughout this country. And, um, you know, the biggest thing to understand, you know, we have, we have tribes which have tribal governments and, and they are sovereign, you know, they're, they're their own nations. They have their own governments, boards and processes and structures. And, but we also have, you know, native nonprofits and we also have something that we call consortia and that's like like some of these tribes are small and and but they want to serve their communities but they may not you know have enough um either members or 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 regional uh, per, uh representation to really apply for some of the federal programs or even some of the grants that are out there so they they bind together in these consortia 
and um, and and are able to apply for different things. So, um, but really, you know, when you when we're dealing with unique individuals, and within those unique individuals, they are they are unique nations. So one, you know, Navajo is not the same as Chickasaw is not the same as um, as uh, any other nation. So there are 574 federally recognized tribes in our country. And uh, approximately 229 of those are located in Alaska alone. And, um, and 345 of those are in 35 other states. But the idea is that these are sovereign entities and we must also stand at, understand that the traditions in each of these entities are unique to the people of e each individual nation. So um, there are additionally, there are 63 state recognized tribes located in 11 states. And so, you know, there's a distinct difference between a state recognized tribe and a federally recognized tribe. Um, and, and this, and I bring that to head here in this discussion, basically because um, many of those uh, differences as far as designation um, allows these organizations to apply for different funding streams. So federally recognized tribes are a lot of, are eligible for a unique set of um, federal funding and state rec many state recognized tribes may also be uh, eligible for federal funding. Um, but in many of our cases, we're, we're serving participants. So, you know, that's really kind of unique and um, uh, it, uh, unique in the fact that if we're providing direct services to um, a Native American, um, they can qualify for, I saw some folks who have um, grants from HHS and I saw some child support, which is HHS as well, I think. Um, but the point is, is that um, those participants, um, we can serve them because they are American citizens, uh, but we can also serve them because uh, uh, they're Native and perhaps there's some opportunities for reaching out to some of these tribal organizations and it may not be the tribal organization that that participant may be associated with. So you may be serving, you know, a, um, a, 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 a tribal member of an Alaska tribe, but they're in, you know, um, you know, Arizona. So maybe you don't have to go to Alaska to see if one of those Alaska tribes will help you support this participant. There may be an opportunity to reach out to a dozen or so Native American organizations that are already in that area. So, you know, and, and providing more support, but I'll talk a little bit about that. But just some, just this quote here from our, one of our previous presidents that, you know, there's, there's a poverty rate, unemployment rate, I'm sorry, on some of our reservations that are, that are well elevated. And, and this is a, a challenge that many of our tribal based organizations are, are dealing with. You know, when you just look at just some of the jobless and unemployment rates for Native Americans, um, you know, just taking the pandemic, you know, the Native American unemployment rate peaked at 28% in April of 2020. And, and that was pretty much double, double any other national average that, that we have. And this, these were not just on reservations, but perhaps off reservations as well. Um, You know, they, so it's a challenge for them to get integrated into the workforce. And even if we drill down into those numbers, we can see just from a, a, a racial, a, a demographic perspective that, you know, our tribal organizations, our, our Native American workforce participants are experiencing that black line there, uh, a significant elevated unemployment rate and compared to all other races. And that and that's an alarming thing to see. So we're we're really dealing with the most impacted demographic in this country, and I'm just showing the the unemployment rates, but there's also health, um, substance abuse, homelessness, mental health, all of these all of these uh, factors are 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 well elevated into the native communities. And I and I talk about just like some of the. Um, opportunities for um, understanding these demographics in the context that there are, are a lot of 
opportunities for partnering with other organizations. Now here, I'm, I'm just listing that there's this program and I'll talk a little bit about it. It's called the, um, the Public Law 477 program. And there are 12 different federal agencies that allow federally recognized tribes to actually pull their, their money over from say HHS or, or the Department of Transportation or Veteran Affairs. They can, they can get a grant from these organizations and carry their money over to the Bureau of Indian Affairs and put all that money in one bucket and actually um, when they put the money in that bucket, it, it eliminates the color of that money, including many of the restrictions for using those funds. So this slide just shows this one program and lists the federal agencies participating in that program with about you know, 315 million in funding between these federal agencies that are distributed to these federally recognized tribes that participate in this funding program. And these, these funds are to support workforce development, not just a training program or you know getting a welder certificate or or a CDL license it's really a holistic opportunity to support these workforce participants from child care to transportation to um, I'll give an example later uh, well, one example I didn't include in this slide deck uh, as again we were at the Navajo um, reservation and one of their center managers just discussed um, a, a participant who was homeless, staying with a, a relative or friend and walking four or five miles to a work site um, every day, showing up on time. And, and the, the, the center manager actually took his own funds and purchased that, that person a, a bicycle to ride his bike to work. And, um, and the person didn't know, he could have used the funds that we provide to purchase that bike because it's a transportation to get to the work site. And so there's some of these flexibilities that, that, that we all, that we all may not be aware of that we can take advantage of. But um, just on this slide, you see some of those, those bars representing funding amounts, you know, and, and it's really just showing you the scale. And, and over on the left, the smallest one is actually for this program is, is, is my, my, the funding that, that our team at DOL provides in this program. And you can see we're, we're just a small amount in that program, but you know, that biggest bar is HHS who provides just a, just a lot of funding to tribes. But this is an opportunity for us to partner and seeing these, these federal agencies just gives us a cue on where we can look to, to facilitate some of those partnerships with, with bringing more diversity to what we're doing. So just, just as far as my team, we are, we are the division of Indian and Native American programs. And we are, uh, we're eight, participants in our, on our team. Um, and um, the majority of our team, seven of those eight, well, six of those eight, and we're actually filling a position right now, six of those eight are enrolled tribal members. So these are folks that our team actually grew up on a reservation, participated in this program per se, worked at a, a grantee organization that serves Native Americans. So you know, our team is really a resource that you can reach out to if you have questions about um, how to integrate and, and where to look and how to bring this type of diversity to some of your efforts. But we do serve as federal project officers. So we're, we're actually in the field overseeing these grants. Um, we do, um, you know, um, we measure performance outcomes from our grantees. Um, we distribute the funding. We help um, implement or or give advice to different parties on how to improve the law, uh, which is the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act, as well as um, setting a national policy and the Code of Federal Regulations, which actually codifies the law into things that we can implement. But we also, our team manages a federal advisory committee. And if you're not familiar with a federal advisory committee, this is a this is a, a a group of folks in law that have been commissioned to come together to actually strategize and develop workforce strategies to help the native workforce. And we convene a Native American Employment Training Council at least twice a year, and they actually provide recommendations to the to the Department of Labor Secretary on how to improve the program. And they've also been called on in different situations to, to provide some advice. 
um, as far as how to support the native workforce better. Now, within that Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, um, we our section is Section 166, and it's called the Indian and Native American Program. And it, it's really focused on targeting funding to support organizations to develop native participants. So we provide funding to the organizations who actually implement on the ground the support needs of those participants. And um, we do this, uh, let's see on this slide, um, we, we've, all of our grantees are uh, either American Indian, uh, Alaska Native, or Native Hawaiian organizations who are intimate in understanding the challenges of their participants. So, and they're they're doing their work in a culturally appropriate manner, and that, and that means something. Um, and you know, we all work with diverse workforces, and perhaps we've never worked with a Native workforce. But um, I'll talk a little bit about some of those challenges and barriers there. But it it really takes some skill and understanding and how to support many of these participants who are dealing with unique challenges. Some of the challenges aren't unique, substance abuse, homelessness, um, child care needs, but then there's some culturally sensitive items that, that really that really sets challenges. But in the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act, our goals are to increase employment, increase occupational skill attainment, improve the quality of the workforce, reduce dependency on public assistance, and enhance productivity and competitiveness and and our and the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act, which many of you um, are receiving funds in different programs, you you may know that it has these performance measures, which are are these um, accountability strategies to figure out whether things are working, and um, and and I'll talk a little bit in a second about our our program. We actually have two sets of pots of funding. And one, and I'll talk about it, but one is applicable to this first set on the left side where you see the five we owe performance measures, um, which include educational training and, and you know how, all, how are people being employed and how long they're being employed, whether they're getting credentials or whether there's just a measurable change in their, their skills. And then um, our program has under that federal advisory committee called the Native American Employment Training Council, they've actually identified some additional measures that, that perhaps are good for identifying whether or not investments in, in, in Native youth are successful. And you see those there on this slide. So we, we have our team, the Division of Indian and Native American Programs, we actually provide grants to about 166 organizations across the country. And, um, and you see there on the map, you know, just some dots that, that show where many of our organizations are. And, um, and we, we distribute our funding on a four-year cycle. So um, every four years, we put out a funding opportunity announcement for these, these Indian organizations, Native Alaska organization or Hawaiian organizations to apply for these funding. And, um, and then we distribute those, the amounts that they are awarded on an annual basis. And so, um, as I talked earlier about that public law 477, um, 71 of our grantees are actually taking the money that we award them over to BIA and putting it into that pot and getting some, some very unique results that may not be accessible to non, to programs that don't participate in that because of some of the restrictions as well as the administrative oversight. So many of those tribes, now that they are, their funding is with the Bureau of Indian Affairs, they report to the Bureau of Indian Affairs rather than that 15 different agencies that they would have had to report to if they were getting funding from all those agencies. So, um, so it's a strategic opportunity for them to participate in that program. So I mentioned that we award a funding announcement every four years, but we also put out sort of some guidance on you know, how to implement the program annually, which we call our tr training advisory guidance letters. And many of you familiar, are familiar with that with some of the other programs that you participate in, such as the National Farm Workers or the uh, other programs that fall under the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act. But just some of the, a snapshot of some of the outcomes that from our program. So we award about 60 million a year. Some of those funds are transferred over to BIA. 
but um, about 45 million is what we're, we're tracking as far as our performance outcomes. And on this slide, just showing you that um, we have about a 98, um, what we call our comprehensive services program, which can serve adults and youth. And um, the average size of our grants are about 230,000. And um, as you can see on that slide on the lower left, that 50% of our grantees are tribes and 39% of nonprofit organizations that are run by a tribe, a tri a, a, um, enrolled tribal person. And, um, and then we have about 11% of tribal consortia. And, and under our program in the last year, we served about 10,000, our grantees served about 10,000 participants. And, um, and then ju there's just a little demographic about the enrollment. You can see that most of the participants in these programs are 25 um, to 54 years of age. But then there's, you know, we serve a lot of youth in the program as well. And these, these funds, you know, they're just regarding the youth, it's year-round activities. And one thing I want to point out there is that here's a, a 10,000 member workforce that has had investments over the past year that are ready to serve in different programs. And, and that's a tremendous opportunity. I was speaking with Kim earlier that, uh, you know, they're, they're like highway projects on a reservation. And so that if, if there's a highway project and within the na nation of, of a sovereign organization, then there, there are workforce participants that are standing ready to participate in that construction project and that workforce. And so is that happening? Maybe, maybe some of you are aware of projects, you know, in Oregon or Denver, you know, the, so or South Dakota or, you know, New Mexico, perhaps, you know, there isn't participation on those that workforce that's available. And perhaps you're, you know, some of these contractors are reaching out to your organizations looking to bring some diversity under some of the requirements of some of their contracts. And here's an opportunity for you to collaborate and support some of these workforce participants mm -hmm. to engage in those activities. But um, just uh, further on that last slide, um, uh, we, we're serving about uh, uh, 10,000 participants there. And, um, and then just some demographics, demographics on our, our youth program. So just more on our comprehensive services program, um, about 19,000 services, total services provided. And these can range from career services to training services to supportive services. And as I mentioned, these are funds that support workforce development. They can support anything from, you know, meals for those folks to, to eat while they're at work, um, equipment that they need to purchase to be a welder, boots and, you know, shields or, or even transportation, you know, um, you know, gift um, fund money cards so that they can, you know, catch Uber, you know, things of those nature. So 6,000 of those participants actually went through an entire cycle of supportive services from our grantees. And 65% of those ended up getting jobs and were and kept jobs within the second quarter after exit. So, you know, almost six months, they, re they retained a job. And then the median, er, median earnings, and this is monthly, was about $6,000. And, um, and then further in the fourth quarter after exit, and, and this is kind of, you know, it's, uh, of the 65% that were employed in the second quarter, that were still employed after second quarter, after exiting the, the program from our grantees, 68% of those were still employed. And there was a 45% um, attainment of a credential. And this could be you know, a high school diploma, it could be a welding certificate or, or even a um, CDL license. So some type of credential. And then just a little a peek at our supplemental youth services program. So there's additional pot of funding, about 14 million that we receive and about um, 6 million of that goes over to the BIA under those federally recognized tribes who are able to co-mingle their funding in that pot and use it to any purposes that they see fit to support their 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 national interests and their their tribal organizations um but um those 65 grantees actually receive our supplemental youth funding and to receive that funding you have to be a federally recognized tribe just to point that out 45 45 thousand dollars is the medium grant for the supplemental youth funding and uh, and about five thousand youth were actually served under under those funds and you can see some demographics on who they were mainly high school or pre-high school participants. And so, 
And let me skip that slide. So just um, just some of the, the services that were provided to some of our, our youth that I showed you on that last slide. Um, these funds, in addition to um, actually um, servicing these folks for mental health or child care, these fun our funds can actually be used to sponsor these participants in a work experience that we call WEX. So we can actually pay their salary for them to go out to a work site so an employer doesn't have the burden take on that burden of, of, of funding, you know, a work, a worker um, in a, in a, you know, temporary basis where they, where they're looking to explore whether or not they should actually hire this person. So some of these funds, some, most of our youth funds were in these, this WEX program, career readiness, um, you know, helping them develop a plan or strategy, counseling, um, supportive services, as I mentioned, like food or, or helping them in different ways. So this is uh, transportation, leadership development, and, and financial literacy. There's some of the areas. Now, digging into the data even further, just looking at where, where have many of the participants that I showed you been, been um, steered towards or where, where have their interests been? And the majority, and this, this isn't a lot of the labor market information data that many of you may be viewing, the um, medical field, nursing, um, truck drivers, medical assistants. So that, that's the, the primary areas here shown here where many of our Native American participants are, are going into the, the fields. And this is not a restriction. This is just what, the, what we found and, and what we've um, tracked. And of course, there are other areas. Um, you know, the Navajo Nation has, a, uh, um, has their own utility company that actually has a, an apprenticeship program. So they have folks going through multiple areas, you know, financial, um, you know, different types of uh, what was the um, uh, solar panels and, and different things like that. So, so the, the items on this slide aren't, aren't a restriction, but just what we saw is some of the primary areas. So when we talk about our native communities, participants, and even our grantees, they, they all have diverse needs and, and context that, uh, that, that, you know, deepening on whether they are in, uh, depending on when they, whether they are in urban or, or reservation um, based settings. And, and this is a, a unique challenge because like our team, we serve nonprofits as well as, you know, uh, governmental organizations within these tribal nations. So, you know, in urban areas, you know, Native Americans are often navigating the challenge of maintaining their cultural identity while integrating into the main, mainstream society. And, you know, although they may have better access to resources like education and healthcare, often they still face, you know, significant disparities, you know, and, and that could range from just discrimination or, you know, um, just some of the modalities that they're bringing from perhaps where they were in, pa in the past and just meeting, um, uh, you know, understanding some of those demographics uh, that are impacting Native communities from, you know, uh, substance abuse or mental health and things like that. But community centers and organizations such as the ones that I showed you on the previous scheme, screen that, that received some of our grant funding, um, they do play a, a very significant role in helping um, many of these urban native um, participants um, stay connected to their heritage, you know, as well as providing support services. Um, um, one, of my uh, one of our team, um, um, Kayla Oliveira, she actually uh, worked at a Southern California um, a tribal grantee uh, called the, um, uh, it's a, the, um, I'm sorry, I just drew a blank, but they, they have cultural activities for their participants and they, they really have that intimate understanding of some of the challenges that are being experienced by their participants. Um, and I'll, I'll, just, I'll share some details about a few of these centers later and just some case examples. Um, but, you know, when you think about a reservation-based organization, workforce development organization, or even participants living on a reservation, you know, the, many of these reservations are geographically isolated, you know, which can limit their access to jobs or even services, you know, when, and these are what contribute to these high rates of poverty on reservations and unemployment. The jobs just aren't there. And despite these challenges, reservations, I mean, they, they are, they're instrumental in preserving these cultural traditions, you know, 574 different federal tribes, each having different languages, spiritual beliefs. But many reservations do struggle with issues like housing and basic utilities, which further compl complicate their, 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 their um, pursuit. 
So just reflecting on the history of Native experience, you know, it's no surprise that it's essential to build trust and respect when we seek to strengthen our relationship with these organizations. You know, the, the trust is a foundation that I've, I've found since I've, I've been in my position for almost two years now. Um, and, you know, these strong relationships is crucial. They, I mean, they're crucial. I didn't talk about my background, but um, I, I was an economist doing a transportation economist. So I worked with some tribal organizations to develop their their grant applications, which had to include these economic impact analyses. And, um, and, and they were really, you know, um, it was a challenge really to get to um, communicate, um, to get um, a dialogue, uh, because there, are, there is this reservation based on history. And we have to be proactive when we're trying to build these relationships. And we have to approach each one of them in, in a unique way um, with respect to the different differences in their history and the cultural and their values. And, uh, and that's important to understand that these cultural nuances between these native communities um, is, is really unique. You know, each each nation has a as a as a their own traditions and social structures, and, and it takes time to learn and appreciate these these cultural aspects, and they can greatly enhance our efforts when we do put the time into understanding. But one of the things is that community leaders, you know, they they actually play a big role in bridging the gap between workforce programs and and the communities that they serve. So really reaching out to community leaders and understanding how to integrate with them and who they are. Um, and, and within many of our grantee organizations, our, workforce, our native workforce development organizations, there's a lot of turnover. Uh, um, the ones that are, the grantees that are on tribal, or, tribal, tribal lands or under tribal government um, structures, you know, they, they have elections, they have presidents that change, they have, you know, Congresses, they have their, all their um, infrastructure and leadership structures that really um, change, you know, as well as the organization. So, um, you know, I'll talk in a second about just, um, you know, maintaining that contact is important because players change routinely, a lot of turnover. But, um, but you know, involving those community leaders is important and particularly involving them in planning and decision making, because this ensures that, that our programs are relevant and effective and it gives, gives them a sense of um, ownership to these programs. Um, uh, working with Native communities to design and implement workforce programs ensures that the programs meet their specific needs and goals. You know, this collaborative approach fosters a sense of ownership, as I mentioned, to, 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 to those folks at, on those um, Native organizations that are, that are collaborating with you. And it also builds trust and respect. So regular communication and feedback are important. You know, in our role here at the Department of Labor and uh, Division of Indian and Native American Programs, it's hard for us to really reach some of our grantees because you know many times they're um, they're wearing multiple hats. I mean, these some of our grantees are two person organizations serving like fifty people, and they're acting as um, you know as a finance manager, as a director, a counselor. Um, you know, they're driving participants. I mean, we we our grantees actually form a an organization called the the National Indian and Native American. National Indian and Native American Employment and Training uh, Conference, and uh, Kim Kim has been to several of our, those conferences, and um, and during one of our ceremonies, we actually highlight some of the activities of many of these grantees, and and it's it's a tearjerker. I mean, just just understanding the the plight of the participants and the passion of the workforce development programs. Um, um, employees, um, it's just, it's overwhelming. And it's encouraging to see that there are folks out there that are, that are so ingrained in supporting the plight of their communities. Um, but as I said, many of these programs are overwhelmed with serving their community leaders, meet, uh, members. Um, and and they're, they're experiencing multiple barriers. Um, you know, demands of the funding organizations, I mean, just the, the organization that are serving participants have demands, and I just showed you a slide with 15 different federal agencies. So if you imagine uh, one, tr one grantee receiving grants from even five of those, they, each of those have these different reporting structures, reporting systems, and you know, imagine if you, you know, right now we have to do our taxes for the state and federal, and that's a challenge. So imagine if you had to report financials to five different federal agencies using five different set of um, financial parameters, and it's it's a it's a it's a it could be overwhelming, and and 
and, and, and it's it's coming from all of those federal agencies at the same time. And so these these um, organizations are dealing with those demands as well as, as I said, just some of the the uh, barriers that their participants are experiencing, which are the most um, impacted demographic in this country. I mean, we we you know, we talk about different areas and demographics in different areas or different races, but the Native American community, um, their 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 modalities, their impl their impacts are more than any other of those that we could think about. So just being proactive and and engaging with those those uh, organizations is is the key. And sometimes, as I said, some of these so if there's a an Alaska participant in in you know Florida, you know, and rather than reaching out to Alaska, or you could reach out to the Alaska tribe and using technology to say you know hey, we have this person that's a member of your tribe and they're here in Florida and we were wondering if you'd like to collaborate to support them. And, um, and, and I'm pretty sure they would be happy to do that. But you know, one part of that uh, interaction is really um, collaborating to share success stories. And, that, and that's important because um, you know, uh, moving the change and chains of success, moving them down the field and actually acknowledging that that there was a win is important for, for all folks involved. So just a couple, couple examples. So um, one of our grantees, the Kiowa Tribe of Oklahoma, they developed a partnership with the casino that's on their reservation. Um, I'm sorry, um, before that, just um, this co-enrollment. So um, just an example I just gave you about the, uh, about the Alaska person in Florida. Um, and, and many of you, um, the grants that you received, you have to actually report on, your, you know, outcomes for your programs as well. So this, this, uh, this opportunity for having multiple organizations support this one participant, it improves your numbers, it improves the performance outcomes of those organizations, because you both get to count that per person as a participant, because you're supporting them. And, and you're supporting them under the parameters of your grant. And whatever the grant says, um, you're able to count them. So just keep that in mind. Um, and so, as I was mentioning, this Kiowa tribe has developed a partnership with a, tr a casino on their reservation. And, you know, they're, they're limited uh, deployment opportunities uh, on that reservation, but they've partnered with the, the, the casino has partnered with the tribal, the, the, the uh, workforce program under the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act. Then they provided several employment opportunities for participants. You know, one of the participants became, um, started off as a server in the casino cafe, but that person, you know, now works as in the human resources department, which is, uh, you know, if you think about that, having that steady job on a reservation is a, is a tremendous opportunity. But, you know, looking at an urban area like um, in Kansas City, you know, the American Indian Center um, in Missouri, they, you know, they have had a long working relationship with, um, many of you are aware of these our, of our one-stop centers, our American job centers, um, but they established a memorandum of understanding with the center to provide the office space um, to members of that organization. And, um, and they're serving, you know, folks in different areas across that, that, or, that area. So I'm not sure how many of you on the call actually are located within an American job center, but, you know, if you think about it, how many, how many tribal organizations are actually participating in that center? And, and it, it could be unique because, you know, participating in these American job centers or these one-stop centers, there's a cost associated with it. And many of our, our, our program, the, this section 166 of the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act, many of them are small tribe. They, they just don't have the funding to actually fully participate in funding one of those centers. But a lot of those centers are actually providing, you know, some workarounds where, okay, if, um, if these tribal members of this organization come and, you know, participate in supporting native native participants um, you know they, they're waiving some of the fees so but then the the intertribal council of michigan provides services to four federally recognized tribes in that area so i told you some of these tribes are smaller so they come together to try to um to pool their 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 efforts and um but they they provide support to participants who was one participant was attending a welding program you know, significant distance from where they lived and um so they you know, no support services. They were able to provide gift cards and other support services to help that participant. And um, that person is now employed as a welder. Um, just a, one more slide here, but, um, you know, during the White House, uh, the White House has an annual Tribal Nations Summit. 
And last December, uh, President Biden signed uh, an executive order called um, Reforming Federal Funding and Support for Tribal Nations to Better Embrace Their Trust Responsibilities and Promote the Next Era of Tribal Self-Determination. So, um, but this executive order directs all federal agencies to reform their federal funding programs to support tribes better. And so here at DOL, you know, we actually, you know, we took a look at many of our funding programs to, to make them better um, accessible to many of our tribal organizations. Uh, and we also, you know, um, extended, you know, did different things with our grants to make sure that, that um, tribal participants, like I said, it could be a two person, um, organizations that's serving 50 people and to think that they have time, you know, to really develop a full grant application within many of the restrictions that we have, you know, it's, it's a challenge for them. So really trying to apply equity into our programs. And so um, just in closing, you know, partnering with the native workforce offers unique opportunities to enhance diversity and, and inclusion in a lot of what we're doing and to serve diverse communities and strengthen economic development. Um, there's, a, there's a workforce that's poised and ready to participate out there and, and collaborating with the organizations that, are, that have um, sort of an intimate relationship with those workers is a true opportunity to, to not only help those communities, but to help yourselves and your, your organizations improve your, your metrics and your measures. Um, but um, you know, in that pursuit of collaboration, building trust and understanding cultural nuances and engaging with community leaders, those are important success strategies. And of course, as I mentioned, you know, there's a lot of over, overturn, um, turnover in these organizations. So keeping that consistent contact, making a regular check-in, whether it be monthly, quarterly, you know, staying abreast of those, those organizations is really important to maintain those, those open channels. And um, you know, like I said, you know, co-enrolling participants, it's a win-win for everyone. Um, you know, implementing some of the technological opportunities to reach those rural, um, you know, these geographically isolated workforce participants is an opportunity. And then like, I showed you a slide that just has 15 different agencies that are um, funding or supporting native communities and leveraging those available resources and providing target training support and advancing um, the different um, goals of these organizations is a true opportunity. And, um, and, and our team, the Division of Indian and Native American Programs at, at the Department of Labor, we definitely would love to hear from many of you. Um, I know that many of you participated in these coaching, there were these coaching activities across the country. And um, I sat in on many of those and I posed that question, how many of you are serving native participants and how many of you have actually sought out to collaborate with native workforce development organizations. And it was few and far between. So I encourage you to, to reach out to our, our department, the Division of Indian Native American Programs or any of those other uh, programs that are actually targeting um, the native workforce. And uh, I appreciate the opportunity to share. Thank you. I'll turn it back to you, Kim. Yeah, Thank we you, have to, Nathaniel. Uh, that was uh, a lot of great information. I took so many notes and I will definitely be going back to review this. Um, again, we will send that recording out to everybody who was not able to join us live. Um, but uh, thank you for just giving us not only that information, but also ways to be able to reach out to you all to partner. So I do want to open it up for questions. We do have some time here. So if anybody has any questions, uh, feel free to take yourself off of mute or you can type it into the chat box and uh, we will we will take any questions. And also I see that Kayla has put uh, in information on an additional webinar that will be available on next week. So there's a link there if you want more, um, more information about that particular webinar that's gonna be offered on November the 20th. So thank you, Kayla, for putting that in there. Um, so again, if we have any questions or any comments, definitely feel free to put it into the chat box or take yourself off of mute. There, there was a comment by um, Julie about um, offering digital self-paced courses for tribes. Did you want to come off mute and talk about that, Julie? That sounds like a great opportunity. Yeah, um, I, I'm not really, I haven't really planned it all out in my head yet, but um, I was just thinking because you were talking about how rural many of the, the people in these communities are, you know, it's probably hard for them to access 
um, trainings and services like that. So um, it's just something that I am developing. I am a brand new company that I am developing um, courses for, I call them workforce empowerment courses, um, basically the soft skills training. And um, I was just thinking it might be something that would benefit them. Yeah, yeah, we found, you know, just with our programs that we managed during the pandemic, many of our grantees weren't prepared to serve their participants in a remote environment. And, um, and, and that, that, that has been, many of those gaps have been closed by different grantees. They're establishing an online presence, uh, um, sort of a, a intake process that can be accomplished through a website. And uh, um, there's one, uh, one of our grantees out in California actually has like a, um, has integrated several IT tools like, um, um, uh, was it, uh, I'm sorry, um, Cash App and some tool like Cash App to actually provide stipends and pay some of the work experience participants and, um, and as well as process some of the paperwork that's involved with um, intaking a new participant, so. Okay, awesome. I will look at your website and see where there might be some options. Thank you. Thank you for that, Julie. Nathaniel, can you talk a little bit about, um, I know we've talked about reaching or your partnership with workforce organizations, but um, can you talk a little bit about how you partner with businesses or what your your outreach to businesses look like? So there's a lot that NAUDOP is doing right now um, around business engagement and business outreach. We're actually doing a business services academy uh, this upcoming year for uh, workforce professionals who work specifically with businesses. So can you talk a little bit about how your what your business outreach or partnerships look like? Yeah, and um, and so far we've been and, you know, our, our mission is to, to provide funding and manage these this regulatory structure um, and, and then make sure that that our grantees are actually uh, performing and, you know, achieving some goals. Um, so we, we're not a, a private focused organization here at the department at, at my team, um, but we have um, encouraged um, participation from um, different organizations at some of the, uh, the outreach events that we're participating in. Um, there's some efforts to increase um, um, diversity on federally funded contracts that, that are falling under sort of different federal agencies have these these regulatory offices that that ensure compliance with diversity goals on contracts. So, like I, I think I mentioned earlier, you know, if you have a project on the Navajo reservation to rehabilitate 100 miles of roadway, including bridges and utilities and water structures, why wouldn't um, Navajo workforce participants be employed on that project? So, um, so we, we're working with some of those contractors um, to make them aware that, hey, um, there are these organizations where you are that are serving natives that, 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 that are pursuing um, skills and, and areas that you are employing in. And, um, and you can work directly with um, these funded organizations to, to funnel these workforce participants on your job. And they're eager to work and they want to work. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. So it, it looks like we do not have any questions in the chat box, which means you did an amazing job of covering all of the points and you answered everybody's questions throughout your presentation. So again, Nathaniel, thank you for joining us here today. Thank you to you all for joining us, taking you know some time out to really learn more about uh, our, our Indian and Native American programs and what those partnership opportunities look like. Um, again, we will have this link posted on our Not Up YouTube channel uh, over the next couple of days. So feel free to continue to share it with your network. And we look forward to our continued partnership. So thank, thank you. you all and enjoy the rest of your Thursday. Thank you for the opportunity.